Welcome to the Mindspace Podcast. I'm Joe Flanders. Thanks for tuning in. The Mindspace Podcast is my personal, in-depth exploration of the science and practice of well-being. I'm sharing this journey with you because I believe we can all lead happier, more meaningful lives by getting the facts and training our minds. Join me as I learn and share the most inspiring insights about human flourishing from leading experts, because we could all use a little more mind space. My guest today is Sugar Sammy. Sugar Sammy is one of the hottest comedians on the international circuit right now. He's performed over 1,700 shows in 32 countries in English, French, Hindi, and Punjabi. He grew up and started his career in Montreal, craftily poking fun at the cultural and linguistic tensions in Quebec. In recent years, he's broken through in the rest of Canada, the U.S., and now France, where he was recently named the new king of comedy. His comedy blends cool charisma, sharp wit, and an immense cultural sensitivity to deliver laughs in an impressive diversity of environments. As you'll hear, Sam is also surprisingly humble, down-to-earth, and well-adjusted, especially for a comedian. And it was a real pleasure to speak to him about how he writes and performs his comedy, his life as a celebrity, how he approaches social media, and how he sustains his own well-being. If you'd like to stay up to date with all the latest news about the Mindspace podcast, please sign up for our mailing list at mindspacewellbeing.com slash newsletter. And if you'd like to support the podcast, please consider rating it on whatever platform you use to get your podcasts. And without any further delay, here is my conversation with comedian Sugar Sammy. First of all, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. <laughs> uh, it's really cool that you're here, actually. Appreciate you, you taking the time. Well, thanks for thinking of me, you know? Yeah. Could have brought in some real legit people. That <laughs> 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 but thought this was a good idea. I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy I'm on your radar. Oh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's really a privilege to have you. Um, so uh, you grew up in Montreal, right? That's right. And... A lot has been said about your origins in Cote de Neige. Yes. Can we just tell people about Cote de Neige, you know, this neighborhood in Montreal and how it influenced you as a person and as a comedian? Um, well, I think every person or comedian, especially, is influenced by their childhood you know, and where they grew up and how they grew up. For me, it was totally, I mean, that's where my par- parents settled because that's where a lot of uh, immigrants settled when they came to Montreal. They, they'd come to Cote d'Inege, central uh, neighborhood in in Montreal. You know, not too far from downtown, but you know, some of the cheapest rent, uh, some of the cheapest uh, retail outlets. I mean, even now, if you go to Plaza Cote d'Inege, there's a plug for Plaza Cote d'Inege. Some people thought it didn't exist anymore, <laughs> but if you want 1985 prices in 2019, go to Plaza Cote d'Inege, get t-shirts for like 58 cents. Like, <laughs> I'm like the dollar store is going to close because everybody else is beating those dollar store prices. Uh, but I, you know, I think that neighborhood influenced me because I grew up around so many cultures. So many people who weren't just, uh, you know, bilingual, but trilingual. Uh, at least, most of my friends were at least trilingual. They'd speak English, French, and another language. So, you know, I think building bridges was something that I was taught very early on. And it wasn't something I was taught, you know, proactively in any way. It was just, you know, that's how I, you know, that was survival. You know, so um, I grew up in a neighborhood that um, lent itself to that, that encourage that i grew up in a school i went to schools that that would encourage that kind of um that kind of behavior and for me i think it definitely helped me um it helped my comedy travel well you know so i was very it was very easy for me to adapt and to write a show for a different culture a different country because i came from that neighborhood that allowed me to do it on a daily basis from the age of like three years old you know so when I hear you talk about that, I think, 
Okay, yeah. So he grew up in a multicultural neighborhood and you speak four languages? Four, yeah. So English, French, Punjabi, and Hindi? That's right. And you're fluent in all four. That's right. And you do comedy. You can do comedy in all four. That's right, yeah. And not just in the four languages, but in the places where these languages are are spoken as the norm. Yes. Which is, we'll get into that, but incredibly fascinating to me. But so when I you know hear you talk about that, I think, okay, yeah, so multicultural neighborhood, but... Not everybody kid growing up in Cote d'Ivoire is like an internationally renowned comedian. Right. So there's more to your success than just the sort of cultural background. Yeah. Well, number one, parents from Cote d'Ivoire never encouraged their kids to be comedians. <laughs> <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't feel like a viable option. It felt like uh, if you went into that, the whole family would be bankrupt. So I was the only crazy one from Cote d'Ivoire. And um, I think a lot of it is also, uh, I think the will, you know, to... to uh, to get to learn from different people. I mean, for me, I don't think I could have been friends with all of these, all the friends that I've had growing up. I don't think I could have been friends with them had I not said to myself, well, I want to get to know them. Mm. Okay, why can't my friend uh, who's Jewish play hockey with us on Friday? Like, why? And then he'd explain to me and then I'd understand and it was no longer a question instead of going, you guys are weird. You know, which is the behavior mm. of a lot of people that you see it in Quebec typically these days, where it's like the fear of the other, mm -hmm. you know, where it's like, ah, well, if they're not like us, well, then I don't really want to get to know them and I don't need to be friends with them and I don't need to do business with them. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine an economy working this way <laughs> without wanting to do business abroad and, you know, you know, exporting any of their their fine products, exporting any of their culture out there. And, you know, just the, just the thought of that to me is like, whoa, how many missed opportunities right. in every sphere? So for, I think for me, one of the reasons that it worked internationally is because I was always uh, very passionate about really writing a show that spoke to people, but not just... Uh, in a way where they're like, oh, that's interesting, this guy from abroad. From abroad. It's like, hey, I want them to say, well, that's interesting that this guy has gotten to know us this well. Mm -hmm. And how does he know us this well? And right. how did he... And so that's, that's what I get in France now because I built a whole show just for France. And it's basically a roast of France, you know, a cultural roast of France. And then the, the way I did it was I spent time there and I actually immersed myself in the culture and very quickly identified what makes us different but what makes them interesting you know because i know a lot of people who've come from quebec who've gone to france and the reason why they didn't make it in france is because they took their F quebec show and they transported it word for word to france and they said oh this should work and they didn't because the style was different the language was different the culture was different And it was almost like watching someone, you know, in, let's say you're, you're Canadian you're, you're, and you're listening to someone talk about, you know, the laws and the, uh, uh, and, the, and the cultural traditions of New Zealand. You're like, fine, it's interesting, but uh, am I going to go see this comedian over someone who can really, uh, you know, who's really uh, adapted their comedy to me, who's talking to me, you mm -hmm. know? They're talking to me. They're not talking about themselves. They're talking about me. So you're actually taking the time to say, hey, look, I'm making this show about you guys. I'm not making it about myself. And that's, I think, the, the mistake a lot of uh, comedians make. They're like, no, I, wanna, I want this to be about me. And I'm like, no, I want them, right. this to be about the, the crowd. I want this to be about the audience. And so companies will make that mistake too. They'll bring a product that's foreign to a new country. And their marketing will and the product will completely will just be exactly the way it was back home and it'll clash with the it'll, with the new context completely yeah. right but the successful companies are the ones who go okay well this is us this is them now how do we make this work abroad how do we speak to them you know? so i did see that headline i think in a french magazine Something like uh, the funniest Frenchman is Quebecois. Right. Right. So it, it took me leaving Quebec to be labeled a Quebecois. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, the other thing that, that I see when I, you know, at the end of your video clips on your website, there are people giving their testimonials about your show. And more than once, the audience members will say it's precise. There's something 
like you're very sharp. I don't mean that in the aggressive sense, but it's like it's very in focus. Mm -hmm. It's not like generally hitting the mark, like you're really hitting the mark with these cultural references. Right. And that's that's unusual to be able to do that in more than one context. Yeah. So how do you do that? And you did mention sort of this openness, curiosity mm -hmm. about the other. Yeah. But you seem to dial it up in a way that most people can't. Right. Well, I think it's homework. A lot of it is yeah. really doing the homework and taking the time and being patient and having that luxury of saying, okay, well, I'm just going to go there, write, test out material every day, see what works and what doesn't. It's almost like you got to master your subject, you know? You know, it's like you're writing a thesis about them. And so you have to really do your research and then cut out the fat and get to, you know, the heart of, uh, the heart of, you know, your subject matter. And I think that's what's, that's what resonates. It's like when you're really mm. able to say, okay, I understand now because I did all this research. It's like a vacuum, right? You're taking everything in. And then, you know, once you get all that information, you got to take, you know, you got to take what you need and you got to take uh, the precise stuff. So like sometimes I'll just test it on, on people from that country. I'll say, what do you think about this? And sometimes they'll say, well, oh, well a lot of people have said that already. So I'm like, oh, I don't want to touch it. You know, and then I'll, you know, and then something, and then I'll say, well, what do you think about this? You know, the, the next thing. And they'll say, oh, this, yeah, this is so true. I never, <laughs> I never, no one's ever said that though before. We know, you know, it's like sometimes things we take for granted, uh, someone else is able to identify about us. You know, and, uh, you know, if someone came in, a comedian uh, from abroad and started talking about the construction in Montreal, I'd be like, well, we've heard it a million times, right? So what's your take on it? Okay, fine. But if they were able to identify something that we've taken for granted for years and then was able to like pinpoint it precisely, we'd be like, ooh, this guy really did his research, you know? Or if they were able to really um, get the gist of what's going on with like uh, Bill 21, which is, you know, um, the bill to ban religious symbols in certain contexts. You know, you'd be like, okay, how do you know this? You know, like, oh, well, I've been here for like, you know, three weeks. I've been reading up on it, watching your news and mm -hmm. talking to people on the ground. You need all of that, you know. You need the, the, um, you need the information from, you know, some sort of news outlet or, or you know, or, or the internet or whatever. But then you also need to be on the ground and right. ask people and talk to them and really get what's, what's at the heart of it, you know. But you grew up here and you have, you know, friends and family and mm -hmm. years of cultural reference, but you pop up in France. Mm -hmm. Who do you who do you test these things with? So, yeah. I I guess you do like small sets in small clubs, right? right? But you got to be chatting with people and and doing it informally. How do who do you talk to in France? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, you, you you start making friends pretty quickly, and then you you just go, you know, then you start asking questions like, hey, yeah, why are you guys always on strike? What's all, what's all the strikes? Hey, um, if you guys are always on strike uh, and on vacation. When does the work get done? You know, so so then they start laughing. They're like, "Man, how'd you notice that?" I was like, "Well, you, I'm like, you guys, don't you notice? There's always a protest. There's always a strike." And they're like, "Yeah." And I'm like, "And you guys do take like three months of vacation? I've never seen that. Like, how does this work? Like, how economically? How does it? You know?" So I think just having a foreigner ask these questions yeah. is funny to them. You yeah. know, this foreigner piece is interesting too because I feel like to get into your kind of persona for a second, you're always working the outsider bit. Yeah. So you're the Quebecois in France. Mm -hmm. You're like the brown guy in Montreal. Mm -hmm. Or you're the Anglo mm -hmm. in Montreal. Or then the, you're the bilingual or whatever. You always have this outsider perspective. Yeah. And which I guess, is that a common thing in comedy? Many people, I mean, comics are typically a bit removed. They yeah. have this bird's eye view of things, right? Or is this something that you cultivate specifically? I think most comics you know, most successful comics have been people who uh, never quite fit in. Yeah. Who are always, you know, working from, you know, uh, a marginal point of view, uh, whether it was in high school, whether it was, I, you know, there's all, there's, there was always that. I think I always felt that way wherever I went. I mean, uh, except, <laughs> except in Cote de <laughs> and still in Cote de Neige where I feel, like I'm at home, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, I went to see Jip at Marianopolis and I felt like that kid who went from public school, who was in like this private school setting with all these rich kids. 
and it was tough to fit in the first uh you know the first uh the first semester mm-hmm. uh my grades weren't going well um i didn't make many friends the first semester and then slowly i started kind of navigating i think for me it's always whenever i come somewhere uh i show up somewhere whether it be uh you know uh high school or cjep or university or a new country you know some people tend to jump into friendships and alliances very quickly and then they realize Oh, I made the wrong friends. <laughs> I made the wrong alliances. You know, you ever notice that first semester of mm-hmm. university? You're like, oh, okay, wait a second. This guy I befriended very quickly. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I should have stayed away from So what I tend to do is I tend to kind of stay quiet and stay in the background for the longest time and then slowly make my moves, mm. you know? And that's in every context. Because you want to you evaluate everything first. You want to get all the information. And then say, okay, now let's start making some choices, you mm-hmm. know. And I think that's a healthy way to approach things. It's also a very lonely way to approach mm, things. Yeah. And I feel like for me, um, in in whichever context I've been working in as a comedian, I've never felt part of mm. the clique of other comedians. You know, I've always been like, even within the comedians, I felt like the outsider. So within the comedy circle, so within the Quebec culture, I mean, I have very little, you know, very few friends, very few, you know, friends as comics, you know, and I'm, you know, and then I start making them. But the friends I do have are very close friends. So I'm very picky and choosy that way. But it also allows me to, like, make fun of everyone (laughs) and not be like, I can't make fun of this person because I'm friends with them. I'll (laughs) see them again. So it's it kind of. And sometimes what happens is, and I've noticed this, um, in many contexts, comedians who grow up in certain circles tend to start sounding alike and having the same points right. of views because they start filtering each other. They're like, well, you're not going to say you like Trump, are you? Uh, we can't hang out with this guy now. Okay, wait, wait a second. You're not going to say that, uh, you know, uh, Bill 21 is, is okay. I tend to appreciate comedy uh also when it comes from um when there are different perspectives like i enjoy when com- like I'll, there'll be a gala and there'll be like six comedians and they're all very different mm-hmm. and they have different points of view and different things that they um different polit- political allegiances even though they're on the same show i find that interesting i find that fun and you tend to see that a lot less these days than you did mm. in the 70s and 80s yeah. everyone's sort of left leaning now Mm -hmm. in comedy and everybody you know everybody's sticking to that discourse Mm -hmm. because it's safer because there's not that social media backlash right so i find that you're losing that kind of you're losing that diversity of opinion in the arts that's interesting i i do want to spend some time on social media because it's very interesting time to be a comedian on social media Mm -hmm. right back to this thing about feeling an outsider feeling at home if i think about your history of the last few years you did over a hundred shows at, at the Olympia, Olympia. Mm-hmm. and it was groundbreaking because it was the first bilingual show and Montreal and even Canada embraced you in a way. Mm-hmm. Uh, you didn't feel part of the city or like that. This was your ground zero. You're like your starting point and this is your home base. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I think the reason why this show was successful here is that a lot of people feel like the outsider here. Oh, wow. It's so interesting, right? Uh, I think in Montreal uh, and in in Quebec, it's very interesting. I think that everybody feels like a minority. Mm -hmm. Everybody feels like the outsider, right? So the Anglos feel like they're the minority within Quebec. Uh, Well, technically we are. We are, right? (laughs) However, the Quebecois feel like they're the minority within North America, yeah. right? Linguistically uh, and culturally. And, and and their language and culture are, are under threat. Under threat, right. By, they're an island in this Anglo-American. Exactly. Yeah. And then, you know, Canadians feel like, well, you know, we're always going to be second place to the U.S., which is right there. So there's so many mm-hmm. uh, contexts within which, you know, someone from Montreal will feel like an outsider. Right. And so I felt like one of the reasons this show connected is because what I was going through, a lot of other people were going through, but nobody told this story on TV. Mm. Nobody s- told this story in a pop 
culture context mm -hmm. ever before you know this this story of someone who you know feels like a minority within a minority within a minority you know so it was um i think that's why it resonated because uh, you know other people felt the same thing and would you say it's a different vibe in toronto or vancouver i mean it definitely is yeah i feel like when i go to toronto i was just in toronto at, for a layover okay and just seeing the diversity in toronto was great however the difference in toronto is it's not an issue mm -hmm. it's normal mm -hmm. it's like there is no oh wow this is interesting They're like what are you talking about that we've been like where you been this is how we've been for the last 30 years this is normal to us there's no issue like you'll turn on the tv you'll turn on canadian television where everybody's based in toronto and uh the news anchor will be brown or asian or and it's not an issue no one says no one says anymore how interesting great they've been so diverse on ctv and on cbc lately and you're like this is just normal now no one's talking about that whereas in quebec you know the fact that Le Gal Artiste, which took place, which is uh, the big awards show, and they did like this photo of all the nominees who were on stage. There was a press conference and there was not one person of color. It was just a sea of white. And then, you know, people thought to themselves, well, well why, uh, well, what do you, well, why is this happening? And, and then, you know, the response was, well, there are no good ethnic actors out there or the you know it's the, the uh, public who that votes so they're you know ethnic comedians aren't as popular as the white ones i was like it's a deeper story that's a symptom of a deeper mm -hmm. issue and the deeper issue is that no one's telling these stories no one that story isn't on tv so you're not getting the ethnic writer producer uh director telling that story that having that point of view on tv you know i left three years ago here like uh, i left uh, quebec three years ago and there's a space that i took up here that no one had taken up and since i left no one has taken up wow i've i've left three years ago and and i had a tv show a successful tv show three seasons of it here which i i co-wrote and co-starred in uh, i had my live show we sold three hundred seventy-two thousand tickets it's the best-selling first one-man show in the history of Quebec. No one has put it on TV yet. I've released it on DVD, on iTunes. No one's put bought the rights for it to be on, on TV because if I, ha I have a feeling there's it uncut, this would be too much trouble. It'll cause way more controversies because it's fine in a theater context, but on TV, millions of people watching this, guys say these things, forget it. And then, um, and then no one's taking up that space. It's a very lonely space to take up because you, it comes with a lot of backlash and it comes with a lot of, um, you know, people looking at you for, in the industry as like, ooh, that guy, that dangerous guy who's talking about these things. You know, if I, you know, if I'm seen fraternizing with him too much, if I post a photo of me going to his show. Even know. now. Even now. And even in the cultural milieu of quebec which is very um big and thriving flourishing like there isn't that openness well there isn't because if you look at the again you look at the gal artists the nominees reflect that you know we're still discussing bill 21 you know yeah. bill 21 where you know religious freedom is under scrutiny right now you know you try explaining that across canada and they're like no that's <laughs> you're lying that's not happening. It's impossible. Yeah. And then people forget. People think this is new. There's a charter of values four years ago. It's pretty much the same discussion, just disguised as something else, yeah. right? So um, I think the reason why, again, the outsider point of view mm -hmm. works is because a lot of people here do feel like the outsider. And I think that's the case in a lot of, in a lot of places. I mean, I go to France and, mm -hmm. and you know, I think people feel that as well the the the, the difference in france is, is that the majority uh doesn't get mad at my comedy they actually go well he's right <laughs> <laughs> he's right we know we know we actually acknowledge that yeah. you know we have been racist historically we kind of still are sometimes 
Yes. You know, my, I start my show in, in France and I go, you know, I love being here in France. You guys are my favorite Arab country. Yeah. I, you know, and right away that gets a laugh. It's such a loaded statement. And there's so much that comes with it. It's a very simple sentence, but so much in it, right? And it resonates with them because they're like, yeah, geez, no one's ever said that before in our country. They took someone from the outside mm-hmm. to say it. And we understand why that's funny. You know, it's jumps out at you when you show up in the u.s because you've you've done a bunch of stuff there as well right, right? well there's so much i mean my <laughs> next uh, my yeah. next my next uh my next show my my u.s based show that i've been building uh really do- focuses on the difference between canadians and americans we're neighbors we're so close you know uh, geographically um and culturally we have some similarities we consume similar things but we're so different when you peel everything away and then when I point those things out, I think the Americans uh, get a kick out of it. And even America's divided. And I talk about how divided it is. You know, it's like the crazy, uh, you know, uh, flag bearing nut jobs on the right. And then, you know, the crybabies on the left, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> it's divided, but not in good ways. You know, nobody's in that center anymore. It's like everything's either uh, uh, a big threat to the country or uh, on the other side, completely offensive and hurtful, you know? And you're like, okay, how is this country functioning? Because it's like, you know, everybody used to be kind of either center left or center right, but everybody's gone either really far to the left or really far to the right. And nobody's right about this. And then, so I kind of identify that and they, they're like, oh, wow, okay, this guy from the outside is actually talking about those two things. And I'm one of those, I'll critique both sides. Mm. So I don't just go critique the right and the Trump supporters. Let's talk about how the left needs to like, you know, man up a little. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's let's I want to jump on that for a second because like many comedians, you could be really mean. Right. Um, and particularly I was watching some of like the improv stuff that mm-hmm. you do, because you have a lot of that on the website, right? And like like straight up insulting people. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it's that simple. It's not that no, no. bad. There's there are nuances and complexities to it. Of course, of course, it. of course. Um, but so if you're not insulting someone, you're insulting his girlfriend or right. something. Like there, there. It's obviously done in good fun, right? And right. you're laughing, and they're laughing. It's all good. But um, what's going on in these contexts? Like, what is so fun about you? It's like, and you do have an edge, right? Yeah. I know you as a very nice guy. And so there's a there's a stage persona that right. I think you're you're kind of uh, you know cultivating and you you know I don't know one of the I think when I saw you, you you've got the leather jacket and like you're you play a bit of a badass right um, and people love it people like to be taken down by the badass right what's that about um, well listen I think some of my favorite comedians have been comedians who've you know, a worn a leather jacket, <laughs> <laughs> a red one, perhaps a red one, perhaps. Right. Um, and even some of my favorite artists are artists who've worn leather jackets. So it's kind of, for me that that's kind of an homage to all of those, uh, artists that I've always, uh, admired. You know, I, I you know, we were talking about, uh, I think, uh, before we started recording the eighties and how I love right. the eighties. So, you know, a lot of the eighties was influenced from a lot of the sixties. So, you know, the leather jacket, you think of Elvis, you think of, you know, uh, Michael Jackson, Prince, George Michael, some of the biggest 80s stars wore leather jackets. So for me, it was like the leather jacket was non-negotiable. You know? <laughs> I had to get a leather jacket. But And number two, I think um, uh, people uh, like to see, especially with comedy, with artists, I think they like to see something where they know there's an element of danger, mm. you know? And they also, it's, and then there's a, a part of it that's magic. They want to see how... Does this man get out of this dangerous situation? How will the laugh happen? Because mm-hmm. we know, we trust that it will. It's like a magician. You trust that they will be able to get out. I mean, not, you know, that doesn't well, the, always the happen. The going to deliver a wow. <laughs> yeah. When the wow is going to come. When's it going to come? And that's what people pay for. Because otherwise, you know, you're just an asshole doing a mean TED talk. <laughs> so, so the wow is getting the laugh in the context of that confrontation of that confrontation but it's not even a confrontation a lot of it is just um you know uh sometimes when 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 i do uh roast someone it's not someone who didn't deserve it you know they 
I mm. never, and it's always, I'm very good at dosing. And I think this is one thing you, you get with, uh, with experience yeah. is you get to learn, well, how much is appropriate? Mm. How far can I go? And when I roast someone and when it goes really far, it only goes as far as they've deserved it. Meaning if they were disruptive mm-hmm. for 45 minutes and they would never let you get to the punchline and they wanted to make the show about them, the audience is hoping mm. that you're going to rip into them and they're going to be, they're going to back this, you know, because they've seen this person be belligerent and misbehave. So I'm able to, to kind of get it. And if someone just makes a mistake by saying something that's inaccurate when I ask a question, well, then it'll be gentle. Mm-hmm. It'll be a gentler thing, you know? Uh, so you kind of, you, you know, it's a, there's, there's an art and a science to it. You gotta, you gotta feel the audience and you gotta feel out uh, what the other person can take, mm-hmm. you know, you know, early on in my career, I obviously made the mistake of going too far or not going far enough where someone was being belligerent and you ignore them. And then the audience goes, well, this guy should have handled it. Yeah. You know, why, why isn't he handling it? Isn't he a professional? And then you kind of lose that credibility of not being, you clear. have to command the room with some degree of dominance or the crowd won't be with you. Is oh that, yeah. yeah. That's what they're there for. Yeah. You know, that's your stage. That's your audience. You have to not only hold them, but you have to be able to drive them for that hour, hour and a half, whatever it is. Um, and if you lose them, and I've seen comedians yeah. lose them, like, you know, early on, and you still see guys, they'll go to comedy clubs and they'll start doing crowd work and they'll lose the audience very quickly. And you can identify the mistakes that they've made, you uh-huh. know? Like, so it, it, it comes with experience, trial and error. So sure. I'm, I, I got to say, early on, uh, you know, I. I wasn't always great at it. (laughs) So those edgier moments where there's a little bit more aggression, playful aggression, Mm -hmm. the hook there is the danger aspect. It's like, wow, he's really pushing the limit with this audience member. Mm -hmm. And it's like escalating. And how does he pull it off and and like resolve it with a joke? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, same thing with material. I mean, I think a lot of the stuff I'm working Mm -hmm. on now Mm -hmm. is, uh, is very edgy, right? So, uh... It's always like, okay, we're going into this topic, we're going into the zone, and then you can see the audience getting a little bit uncomfortable, like, how is he going to get out of this? My girlfriend's next to me, she's not going to like this, I'm going to have to pretend I don't like it, I'm going to have to apologize because of what this guy's saying, and then you surprise them with a great punchline, mm-hmm. and then you're able to get out of it. And I kind of like that, you know, you're like, you're, you're like okay, you, you, know, you dig a hole for yourself, and then you see how you get out of it. You know, and I think that's why people enjoy that kind of comedy. They enjoy going to a theme park, mm-hmm. the roller coaster ride. You know, it feels dangerous, but you trust that the technology right. and the science and everything behind it is going to get you out of there safe. Well, that's, what, again, what I find so interesting about these takedown moments, because it totally depends on the trust. Mm-hmm. And I'm guessing you're building that trust as the evening goes on. All right, yeah. But... You don't want to lose that and and you're you know you've been doing it for a long time so you do you know what indicators to read and and you know how to push the limit without going too far and this kind of thing yeah and i mean with uh with improv with like uh crowd work it's way more dangerous than obviously written material right, right? right. but with written material it's the same thing you you kind of have to uh know how to pace your material Meaning like I'll have a set list and I won't go into the most dangerous stuff right away. Right. Right. It's like a date, you know, you go on a date, the person you're on a date with, you want them, you slowly go into small talk, talk about work, talk about, you know, whatever. And then, then you test your boundaries on where you can go and slowly (laughs) build to a point where, okay, I've crossed this line and this was okay. We are going to talk about Aziz Ansari in a second here. I don't know. (laughs) That's where you're headed here, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> sure, but um, but I think uh, you know uh, an, uh, a show with uh, a, c- a comedy show is kind of like that. It's like a date for an hour and a half, and then you want them leaving, going, "Wow, I want to see him again." Yeah, you know. I wonder if again the outsider status mm-hmm. affords you more flexibility there. If you were like, like I don't know, this is a dumb like '80s reference, but if you were like the captain of the football team mm-hmm. a white guy that everybody loved and you were just a dick i don't know if i should say that on this. <laughs> if you were just fine. mean <laughs> yeah, it's fine. if you were just mean right it would it would come across differently i heard for example ricky gervais talk recently about 
he sees himself as like uh, in the lineage of the court jester. Right. And the court jester's role is to speak truth to power, right. but to do it from the role fr- from within the context of the commoners. Right. So he's always cutting himself down mm-hmm. in a way. And the joke is often on him. Mm-hmm. And that, that gives him a few degrees of freedom to, to push the limits with people. Right. What do you make of that theory? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's who I am. I think if I was a white guy, I'd be able to kind of get away with what I do anyway. Yeah. There's pl- there are plenty of white comedians who I love and who cross the line and who have these, you know, points of view where I'm like, wow, how does he get away with yeah. it? You know, some of my favorites historically, Don Rickles. Yeah. You know, you look at Rickles, Rickles would rip on everything and go so far in terms of race, uh, sexual orientation, just everything, you know, like Don Rickles. I mean, Archie Bunker, all in the family. You look at that character on TV. This guy had so many flaws, but one of the most likable characters and beloved characters in the history of television. Uh, one of my favorite comedians working today, Bill Burr, you know, <laughs> it feels like he's angry at everything, <laughs> but makes me laugh so much. Um, I think, uh, you know, the, the, um, the way to succeed in being able to pull those things off is always making sure that you're precise in how you um, how you pace your material and how mm. you write your material. So a yeah. lot of it is in the writing, but a lot of it is in the pacing too. Yeah. So if I have something very dangerous, you know, I'll make sure that I have my next bit will be one of those surefire works 100% of the time bits, meaning that I'll make them forget. You, you know, you make them forget what just happened. You know, you make them, you soften it by mm-hmm. something that's going to mm-hmm. work no matter what, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and sometimes I'll do it. If it's really dangerous, I'll put a bit like that before and after, you know. So you sandwich that bit. Yeah. So I think you're able to do it because people don't just remember one joke. Right. You know, um, you know, when they leave a show, they'll remember the general vibe of it. I mean, my new show, I, t- I, t- I tell the audience straight up now, I go, look, in my show, there's going to be a 90-10 rule. You'll love not 90% of it. 10% of it will piss you off. <laughs> and that 10% will be different for everybody. Now, if I listen to everyone, mm. I wouldn't have a show. You know, what, do you, what would you rather have? Would you have 100% of an okay show or 90% of a great show? Mm-hmm. 10% kind of hurt, but 90% was great. I was like, you know, when you try to please everyone, you please nobody. You right. Know? You know, what do you, who do you become if you try to please everybody? Mm-hmm. Well, I guess you could become prime minister of Canada, but. <laughs> <laughs> so i pretty much tell them that like sure. i say look this is what's going to happen yeah. so they kind of know and they like it they're like i want i want this i don't see this on tv anymore everybody's always apologizing before they yeah. say something you know so it's interesting because that speaks to kind of the angle i was curious about when i asked you why do people show up for these takedowns mm-hmm. and uh or, or why do people show up for something that 10 percent they're going to be like really pissed off about mm-hmm. and the kind of touchy feely thing I had in my mind is like people just love to laugh mm-hmm. and they love to laugh with other people. Mm-hmm. So I'm just curious about your sense of like why comedy is so important to people that they'll, they'll put up with being offended or being taken down or whatever. Because yeah. um, there's something very deeply uh, healing or important or, or cathartic or something. Yeah. Well, there, it is therapeutic. I mean, I love laughing. You know, a lot of comedians, you know, you see them they're like, ah, I don't really love laughing, but that's not true. Comedians do love laughing as well. And like, I, I know for me, it's one of those feelings that you can't control. Mm-hmm. And it's one of the best feelings that you can get. And I think people seek that today too. You know, exercise, like I was saying, sleeping well. And I think a good dose of comedy, uh, you know, nothing feels better. I, I, I know... You know, I have a fan base that likes coming out to my shows because they feel like uh, it it will be like a roller coaster ride, you know. But they'll come out happier than they left. So I don't know. I guess I guess that's what it is. I couldn't give you more. I mean, I'm sure there's scientific data that <laughs> kind of will explain it a little mm-hmm. bit better. But I think for me, you know, it's that human connection that you can get with someone from laughing. I think you know, uh, even look at it. Uh, when you're having dinner with friends, how much fun is it when uh, it's not all about just, you know, 
sharing feelings and 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 and, uh, and talking about work and and talking about the mundane but you also get great laughs out of it but i mean if you could combine both if you touch people in a deep way and then you're able to give them the laughs that's great as well yeah, i don't know why you're throwing shadow on sharing feelings <laughs> <laughs> but i think the, the the combination of it is great you know for me i, I think um the older I get, the uh, I think the more prolific I'm getting in terms of my writing, and and uh, I think uh, my writing's getting more diverse, more complex, and I also I'm growing as a person, so it gets deeper. You know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm talking about you know being uh, a man in my 40s now. You know, I never thought it, as a comedian when I'd watch comedians that I loved, I never thought that would be something I could that would appeal to me. But mm-hmm. you know, I have, I'm, I'm starting to talk about I'm starting to talk about the differences of of uh you know how i was when i was you know in my 20s and and what life is like now you know that eight hours of sleep man (laughs) it's 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 very important to me it's like it it, it, when i was in my 20s it didn't matter (laughs) you know and i talked to and and the thing is now it's like i feel like that guy was getting a little bit older and i talked to the millennials like that you know you millennials (laughs) <laughs> with your You're feelings now. with your yeah. feelings <laughs> back in my day <laughs> we didn't have feelings so let's talk about that for a second um you do have a bit of a crazy life uh, at least your work life is crazy mm-hmm. but unlike the sort of stereotypical comedian your personal life is not a train wreck mm-hmm. uh you're a pretty low-key guy mm-hmm. i'm just kind of curious to hear about that first of all how do you kind of stay level-headed in terms of the celebrity aspect Mm -hmm. and just the day-to-day grind of working a lot, uh, you know, being in demand and traveling and having to just sustain your energies? Yeah. Well, I think if I really, really get to the heart of it, it's got to be the fact that I love what I do. You know, I never did it for the celebrity. I never did it for the fame, the money. I never went to seek all of that. I really did it because I love writing jokes and I love performing on stage. I love putting those things together. Mm -hmm. And I've always just wanted to do that. So when when I think when there's no real crazy void, you know, I I have a family life that's amazing. You know, I have loving parents and, uh, you know, two siblings that I love. Uh... A girlfriend who I've been with for six years and it's like going so well with her so it's like all those things are sort of you know to me uh, the priority if I can just make sure that that keeps going well and I keep coming up with material and I keep being able to do what I do that's all I need I don't need to go out there and spend my money and show it off I mean I'm it's never been about that you Mm -hmm. know it's never been about that like for me the little, the simple things. I never, uh, I think one of the things that keeps me sane and doesn't keep me going crazy is I never spend beyond my means. And I've never been that cliche of, you know, those celebrities who just go crazy and then and then they're left with nothing. But hold on, I just want to challenge you there. You say like you've always spent within your means, but you could spend within your means and have the full range of celebrity consumer goods right because you make a lot of money now right so meaning you spend your um humble with your needs yeah i mean i just i feel like once the basics are taken care of Uh, i mean you don't really need more than that you know i mean like i'm not going to the club and buying champagne and vodka for everybody and and you know having like that ten thousand dollar bill like you know one of our treats, my, my girlfriend and I were home, is like, hey, let's go for a morning walk and pick up coffee. <laughs> yeah. And we're like that old couple that just likes going for a walk. Yeah. You know, so um, I enjoy those those moments, you know. Mm-hmm. I think for the same thing with my family, just going to visit them and making sure that uh, I spend time with them. I think my the biggest luxury that I see uh, being at the level that I am is having time mm-hmm. to be with the people I love and not just running around. Uh, taking care of the necessities. I think time, and and the older I get, the more I realize that that's the biggest commodity mm. that you can have is time. You know, it's I think it's a bit of a cliche to say it, but it's so true. You know, spending that time with everybody. You know, uh, you're never gonna get that back. You're never gonna be able to get that back. You know, and you realize that the older you get, and so I try to just 
do that and honestly it also feeds my material <laughs> i mean <laughs> some of it has got to be selfish i mean you know now having a girlfriend like i told her i said this is the only time where where me telling you uh that you're my muse is not a compliment <laughs> you know like an artist telling his girlfriend that she's right. his muse in every other context music uh, you know, painters will say it, yeah. sculptors will say it. But if a comedian says <laughs> yeah. it, you're in big trouble. Yeah. So, you know, I've been coming up with a lot of uh, material and embracing the changes in my life, you know, I'm embracing being a little bit older, embracing, you know, having nieces and nephews, wanting kids of my own, you know. Um, and, um, and you know, there's and I've been writing about the difference in your 40s and your 20s, things that you paid attention to. Uh, that you didn't pay attention to, that you thought you were too much of a big shot to pay attention to in your 20s and your 40s, you start paying attention to you know, commercials with buzzwords like fiber. <laughs> you, know, like, <laughs> you know, you're like, ah, I need that. Let me get. So, you know, I, I think um, for me, I think that's the biggest luxury. So chatting with other public figures one of the trappings of the lifestyle is how rewarding like for your brain literally like saying a punchline that you wrote that you thought about and then 1500 people laughing out of control because it just you just nailed it and people love you for having that that's it's a great feeling right yeah and it's the kind of thing that somebody could get addicted to right and the same could be said for putting that perfect, awesome, beautiful picture of my vacation on Instagram. Right. You're just getting a few likes or like, this is what our brain kind of feeds on, this mm. sort of social reinforcement. But you're able to do that without it kind of hijacking your brain and making you a slave to it. Yeah. How do you explain that? Um, I mean, the social media thing, I think, is, is definitely not uh, something I'm addicted to, but being up there on stage and telling jokes, yeah. I mean, I don't think I'm beyond that trapping. <laughs> like, I really, I do love going up there and uh, making 1,500 people laugh, writing that new bit. So, um, But the rest of your life is in balance. The rest of my life is in balance. But I think that's definitely, um, I wouldn't say a, an addiction, but listen, if, you know, I, I was on vacation for two weeks. And I can't wait to get back up on stage. You know, like I, I, I do have that need to. Yeah. And I wrote so much when I was when my brain was not thinking about comedy. That's when I write so much. I told my I told my girlfriend we were on vacation. I said, okay, no work on vacation, no work. But as soon as I said it. no work, the yeah. inspiration yeah. would come, and you can't neglect it. So you know, I'd be at the uh, hotel restaurant and I'd ask the waiter, can I please have paper and pen? Because I'd leave the phone um, in the room. I didn't want to have the phone with me uh, on vacation. You know, I'd always leave it in the room so that I wasn't looking at my phone, mm -hmm. you know, while I was uh, trying to get away from all of that. So I had scraps of paper everywhere. And honestly, I think, Joe, I think I wrote so much gold in the last two weeks. I can't wait to get up there this weekend and just make sure that I was right about it as well. You know? mm -hmm. So it's just stuff that was coming to me um, from just hanging out and seeing these, being changing my context up. That always happens. Yeah. Whenever I change up my context uh, and, and uh, I change my routine up, um, loads of new material just comes to me. In a way, you're very lucky. And I don't know if it's luck. You... you cultivate this kind of balance in your life uh -huh. but you are to some extent in the public image right and with social media this is more of an issue than it was 20 years ago but comedians are not having an easy time these days right yeah. and you mentioned earlier that there's this kind of like boring little center left niche that all the comedians are occupying now because they don't want to get in too much trouble on social yeah. media and there are some comedians that have gotten into serious trouble, right? The, sure. uh, I think Aziz Ansari just came out with his sort of comeback Netflix show and the Louis C.K. thing was a major nightmare for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Are you, does it concern you, the fact that your stuff is edgy? Are you concerned about offending people? Is it a difficult time to be a comedian? What's your, your take on what's happening? Well... There's two ways of looking at it. I think um, it is a more difficult time to be a comedian, but it's also a better time to be a comedian because 
historically the guys who were edgier uh, mm. always got you know broke through in a different way like they built their own new almost own own new model own own new industry you know they were always like the Eddie Murphys the Richard Pryors you look at these guys they were always seen as these trailblazers so it's become easier to be edgy now mm. so <laughs> it's kind of an advantage because you could create controversies pretty quickly <laughs> so i'm like oh, okay i guess i'm edgy now you know uh-huh. uh good all right that's number one you know you get talked about way more but uh there is that social media backlash so uh a lot of times people are like oh i don't want to be in the middle of that because it is a lot to take and i've been in the middle of that a few times have you had some kind of social media blowback so, so many controversies i mean when i especially when i did my quebec show yeah uh, i mean the whole <laughs> i mean i mean real controversies <laughs> I don't mean the so- the crazy sovereignness. I mean real controversies from real people. <laughs> but no, so whenever, you know, I take a jab at uh, Pauline Marois or I took a jab at uh, the OQLF, the uh, language police here, uh, huge backlash, uh, crazy amounts of... Um, of uh of email and media stories and and people jumping on the bandwagon and then it, it just kind of you know it snowballs uh, snowballs and it becomes a thing on its own uh the the thing that you have to have when that happens and that's mm. why i'm preparing for my next show here is you have to have a very strong team mm. you know that doesn't panic while that's happening so uh, i'm putting uh a uh, <laughs> a uh, crisis management team together full time for when my next show comes out <laughs> because I feel like you know if you just stay away from social media well you you know all of that doesn't really happen and I think it, it it doesn't affect you as much I think it the key is to really stay grounded while it's happening stay focused and then you know answer in your own comedic tone when it's time to do it it, it is funny because it's hard for me to separate like the Pauline Marowa thing and like a Me Too scandal. Right. Like these are on opposite ends of the distribution. Right. But, but that, that might be my, my prejudice. Right, I got kind you. Of, but playing I, out here, but... Yeah, I think the thing with with uh, Aziz and Zari and Louis C.K. is that the controversies don't stem from something they've done on stage. Right. It some, stems from something they've done in real life. Right, but they're under scrutiny mm-hmm. because of what they do on stage. Right. Well, the thing is, I mean... My personal life has been very clean, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. so I think it kind of gives me the license to do to be as edgy as I want on stage because you know no one's going to ever be able to compare and say, well, look at that, he is he is a jerk, you know? right? It's like I find some of my favorite comedians are the ones who are like like pretty um, you know unapologetic on stage. But like the nicest guys in real life. And I've met a few of those. And I always feel like those guys, those artists are the best because, you know, they say, you know, that's my work. They're able to separate their work in their real life. That's my work. And this is what my work is. My work is edgy. It's different. It's like watching a great action film. Like, and then you see the guy who wrote it and directed it. And like, well, that's not how he is in real yeah. life. He's not going around blowing up buildings. Yeah. And, you know, this guy doesn't carry weapons with him everywhere he goes so it's like you have to kind of and for myself i separate that as well i you know i do put my personal life in my work but obviously you know the thing with comedy is for it to be funny there's got to be a part of it that's fictionalized as well Mm. you know so like the punchlines are you know um uh you know uh misdirected uh jokes that you know people don't see coming so that's it's it's always got to be that you know i like i take the piss out of my girlfriend now and and her family but you know obviously it's not funny to see a guy on stage talking about how much he's in love with his lady and how it's great it's funnier when you're you know you're uh, critiquing your uh, your family so but so that's an interesting one because with the girlfriend we you talked before about you know building the the sort of arc to your set mm. and placing the right jokes at the right point so to build the trust and build the momentum of the show so obviously there's a huge amount of trust with your girlfriend and her family, right? Mm-hmm. But you, so that's an easy one in a way. But I'm wondering like when you're, you know, you have this new material that you're, that you want to work up now and stuff. 
does it change the way like the the scrutiny and the social media and just pc culture and and i don't want to be super, you know super critical of yeah. pc culture i there's some merits to it and it's it's obviously a subtle issue and there are two mm. sides and but are you more afraid to go places now than you were because of this scrutiny around like political scrutiny around your position on sensitive issues um no i think i'm less scared now less scared yeah right? yeah i think uh as you know i think also because i've been working in france and yes. it takes a lot to offend them they love it oh. they're like masochistic with it. so i've gotten this appetite to write in this way uh-huh you know and in this way where you know it shocks them but they love it you know and i feel like i'm not gonna now scale back by coming to north america coming back to north america with my new show so you know uh i'm writing with that same fire and that same appetite that i had in in europe and and i you know want, want my audience as an artist you you know you want to be better than your 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 previous show so i want to evolve in a way where they know it's me but i still surprise them you know and that's the tough balance it's like you know every artist has that with their second album or their second special. Mm-hmm. It's like, ooh, the first one, we love that first one. That second one better be good, right? Mm-hmm. But you also want to give them something different. You don't want people saying, well, it was kind of the same thing as the first one, you know? And I think for me, it's also, I like challenging mm-hmm. what's going on. I like going against the grain. I like going uh, against the current. And it's it's good because, again, it's a lonely place, but it's also your own lane, you know? It's you got your own lane to yourself because it's very hard. A lot of people don't want to get in in that in that lane. It's mm-hmm. a hard space to occupy. It comes with a lot of, like you said, scrutiny uh, and potential risks. backlash yeah. and risks. And you know that one tweet, you know, that someone will say, "Well, I find this guy, you know, this and this and this." And then, so you think you can push the boundaries of what's culturally accepted Mm. more safely if your personal life is clean (laughs) i don't know (laughs) i don't know i mean i just feel like i do that i don't know in general Uh i mean uh you know i'm hoping most comedians have a pretty clean personal life but as you can see right uh you know with bill cosby and uh and all these others to mention bill cosby Cosby. i mean yeah yeah. he's the only one who's been convicted you know so so uh yeah i mean i don't worry about it because i you know i don't have anything to worry about but i don't know what the other guys are are thinking you know i mean i'm sure when the me too movement happened everybody started going through their rolodex and you know going through their phone book and like did i what did i what did you know like kind of just (laughs) reliving their past 20 years and seeing if there's anything to worry about but i mean for me i think uh my I've always strived to make my personal life so, you know, peaceful. And and, and I think that's what one thing that um, that I always seek. If there's anything that I strive to have, it's that, is keeping that balance at home um, and, 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 and nothing more. And I think for me, uh, you know, I think... If I did have a uh, a crazy personal life where, where there were where there was criminal activity involved, <laughs> yeah, I probably wouldn't be doing this kind of comedy on stage. Actually, if you put it that way, mm-hmm. now if I analyze it that way, okay, if I had this crazy personal life, would I be doing? The, I don't even. I don't. I don't think so. It's you know because then, yeah, yeah. Well, I mentioned this earlier, and I could be wrong, but. I do have the sense that you get away with pushing the boundaries because you're a nice guy. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because most of the time when I'm on stage, I'm just having fun. Yeah. And, you know, I meet every fan after the show. So I I sit, I stick around, I meet everybody. And, you know, um, my only goal is to make everybody laugh. Um, you know, and if they get something out of it, great. And then, um, and then, you know, when I go home, I'm just, I'm just a regular guy, you know, <laughs> I'm just a regular guy when I go home, you know, and I think even, um, 
my opening act was like uh, we toured Quebec for like four years, and he was like, "This is this is actually the most boring tour in <laughs> Quebec history." Yeah. He's like, he's, he was like, because we'd go, we'd finish the show, we'd go back to the hotel room, and you know, it was myself, the security guy, my security guy, uh, my technical director, and my um, my opening act, and we just go to my hotel room, play poker, and have and bring like a big bowl of veggies from the grocery <laughs> store, and like I'd have tea because i didn't drink and then he was like man officially voted the most (laughs) boring tour (laughs) on uh but it's because i actually do it for i never did it to pick up girls i never did it to uh have the lavish uh homes and cars and i just did it because i love doing it and i just want to keep having the luxury of just doing this and nothing else and not have to take any other job and and even any other kind of job in TV or film or in uh, you know that I don't want to do. So I always am you know I always am very patient with my career too because I didn't blow out all my money <laughs> away, and I just pick and choose the things I really want to do that I'm really passionate about because I always feel like if I am truly passionate about it, it will succeed. You know, and that's where my passion goes. Man, this is. People are going to listen to this and go, this guy is boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, probably. Probably. All he talked about was eight hours of sleep and tea. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, maybe one last question, if, if you don't mind. I know we're, we're getting on past an hour here. Sure. What advice would you have for someone that wants to be successful mm-hmm. in a career? Could be, you know, in show business, but also doesn't want to go crazy. Um, I think you got to work on yourself, um, before you get to that level. So make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. Um, really ground yourself in your, in your real life, you know, and do it for the right reasons, especially in this business. If you're doing it for the fame and the money, this could be a long, long road because the percentage of people who actually make a living doing this is so minute um you have to be very patient i mean this is my 23rd year of doing comedy and for the first 10 i didn't make any money doing Mm -hmm. it um but you gotta love the process and there are no no shortcuts people always want the shortcut for everything everything working out uh, diet exercise give me the give me the give me the shortcut how do i you know it's the what's gonna save you is building it long term and building it for real and building a real foundation in your life and in your work. Um, so work hard, be consistent, and always make sure you're giving your best because it'll lead to great things. You know. You are boring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do people work on themselves? You're saying getting in for the right reasons. Yeah, get in it for the right reasons. Because if you got it, you can only get into this business if you love it. And I mean, love it when it's hard, Mm -hmm. you know? Like, not love it when it's great. Because everybody's going to love it when it's great. You got to love it when it's hard. You got to stick to it when it's tough. That's the ones who usually end up making it, is the ones who stick with it when it's tough and work on themselves and evolve every day. Mm -hmm. Meaning, they get better at every aspect of not only their work but their lives every day. They improve. They look at improve, improving themselves every day. You know, if you're not growing, well, then you know, then you're getting worse because all these other people yeah. who are your competitors, because in comedy, uh, it doesn't lie. Your competitors will surpass you. The yeah. guys who keep working at it, who who, who 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 get off stage and go, okay, what did I do wrong? How can I improve this? And how can I make my next set better? Okay, I figured it out. This is where I went wrong. And even get outside advice, you know? Ask other comics, why didn't this work? What did, you know, ask someone you trust. I mean, I think that's, uh, that's always uh, mm-hmm. essential, is, is working on it. Because I've seen guys in this business who've been doing the same set for years. Not getting the laughs and keep coming back with the same set and not improving on it or barely improving. And I'm like, 
what are you doing this for? And a lot of it's different reasons. It's either, uh, you know, I'm doing it because I want to be an actor and this might be the way in. and Or uh, sometimes it's just uh, uh, for that feeling of belonging to the other group of comedians. So you just kind of show up, you do your set, you get off, and you talk shit about everybody else and you're in the back of the room. And it's like, hey, we have that sense of belonging. It's, you know, they say it's lonely. When you're at the top, it's kind of like the guys who do make it, like end up mm-hmm. touring and leaving, and 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 they're not part of the group anymore because they're off to other things. Well, some guys, for some reason, want to hang on to the group, you know, and don't want to don't want to leave. So there's that sense as well. And you, you know, when I come back, and I, you know, because you you still jump onto these open mics and you jump onto um, different shows to try to test your material. I do that all the time when I'm back home. And you'll see guys who've been working for years who are doing the same thing. And they're in the back of the room talking shit about that new kid who's surpassing them instead of, you know, going to the club, writing, doing their material, improving on it every day, going back home. I mean, I was always the guy. I'd come to the show. I'd do my show. And then, you know, I'd hang out with the fans, say hello to them, go back home and start working on the material again. You know, like you have to have that sort of work ethic and obsession with it as well, Mm -hmm. I think. Hmm. So we're well past an hour here, <laughs> and uh, that was actually really interesting. I, I appreciate all everything you said. Um, I'm I don't want to use up your voice too much. You got a lot of a lot of work to do with that voice of yours. So um, before I let you go, tell us what's coming up for you. You're right. heading off to France. You're back and forth. You got all kinds of stuff. So so tell us what you're up to and how people can learn about what you're doing okay well i have some secret shows in montreal so all of uh the montreal listeners uh make sure you sign up to my website sugarsammy.com i do secret shows all over the city these very cool intimate underground shows 100 people where i'm really testing my material for my next show lots of fun these are the most these, these shows are the most fun that i have um then i'm going to france for incroyable talent my second season i'm uh um, judging the French, which is great to get paid for something you love doing, anyways. And this is the French version of America's Got Talent. That's right. And you're the Simon Cowell That's character, right. which is incredible. That's right. So again, I'm playing that 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 role. So uh, and then uh, cross Canada tour, everything but Quebec. So uh, from uh, September 1st to October 12th, coast to coast, and then touring France in the fall. Wow. So, and uh, all info at sugarsammy.com. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. And good luck with the with all those all those exciting uh, activities. Thank you. All right. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Mindspace podcast. I hope it was inspiring. If you feel the world could use a little more Mindspace, please consider supporting the podcast. The best way to do that is to leave a review on the Apple Podcast app or wherever you listen, or share your favorite episode on social media. Thanks and be well. Be well.